Professor Leibkap has his PhD in economics from the University of Pennsylvania and his Bachelor of Arts from the University of Montana. He is also a research associate currently with the National Bureau of Economic Research. Uh, and as is uh, underscored by the title of Gary's talk, uh, his uh, research focuses on property rights and environmental resources and how, to, uh, how property rights to natural and environmental resources can be defined and enforced to address the problems of open access. His work encompasses economics and law, economic history, natural resource economics, and economic geography. Uh, his talk, Collective Action by Contract, Prior Appropriation Rights and the Development of Irrigation in the Western United States, focuses, of course, on a topic that is of intrinsic interest to all of us living in California, where water rights and water rights issues and controversies continue to be very important issues. Please join me in welcoming Gary Leibkamp. So this is a, a, a study that I'm going to uh, dis discuss with you about surface water rights, prior appropriation, and it's going to be based on Colorado data, and it's going to be uh, motivated by the development of water rights to uh, uh, promote irrigation and agriculture. The broad lessons of the discussion, though, apply beyond Colorado and apply beyond irrigation, um, because this is how the water rights system developed in the western U.S. and it's the water rights system that we have today and um, it's it really critical to understand why it emerged in the way that it did and then to, to keep in mind that that's going to shape how we respond to a, a variety of, of uh, resource and environmental issues. And so shortly, uh, as I understand it, the State uh, Water Resources Control Board uh, is going to uh, implement uh, some minimum stream flows uh, in, in parts of the San Joaquin uh, Basin. And um, I think that this is probably going to clash directly with the incumbent right system, and it's probably going to slow down any desirable um, environmental uh, benefit that we might want, because it's going to cl clash directly with the incumbent right system. And um, so I, I think it's really important to, to understand uh, prior appropriation. Uh, before I get into that, uh, I would like to get a sense. How many of you know uh, what prior appropriation rights are? Okay. So we, for those of you who don't, we'll find out. How many of you have a positive scent, feeling or impression of the role of prior appropriation? Okay, so it's an even smaller group. <laughs> How many of you think these are an anachronism uh, based on historical uh, this and that, and they impede uh, progress in water today? Okay, so that's this. And so these are all, you know, all part of the scene as we uh, deal with the likelihood of continuing drought, or at least uh, pervasive periodic droughts, and. Uh, and changes in, in precipitation patterns and, and, and what have you in the West at the same time that this, this part of the country is growing. Um, so we'll, we'll come back to these issues uh, at the end. I also want to uh, point out that um, the surprising lack of quantitative imperial, uh, empirical investigation into water. Um, now, in part, that's because data are really hard to assemble, and I'll show you how difficult it was for us to assemble the data that we do, we do use. Um, it's also, in part, because water's been so cheap for so long that it was hardly worth really studying. But our paper really draws upon literatures from the 1970s, uh, late 1970s and early 80s in economics. Um, and there's really a, a huge void uh, in, in the economics literature, at least, uh, beyond that. And so um, for those of you who are interested in water and moving forward in our understanding of water and how to allocate it and manage it and whatever, there's a huge opportunity 
uh, to do so, but it won't be, won't be easy, uh, but it'll be important to do. So uh, at any rate, this paper is joint with uh, Brian Leonard, who is a PhD student at Santa Barbara, is now at uh, Arizona State. <clears throat> And let me just shift uh, up forward here for just a minute and come back. Um, the Western US uh, and uh, Western Canada are unique in having a system of water rights that are based on prior appropriation. It's a priority-based system, first in time, first in right, and it assigns a fixed quantity of water at the diversion site. Okay. So that is totally different from the riparian system, which exists uh, in eastern U.S. and in, 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 in other areas uh, of, of Western Europe and, and so forth. There, each adjacent landowner to a stream has the right to claim and use water for reasonable use. It doesn't assign a fixed quantified amount, and all parties on the stream share that water. Okay? That's very different from the kind of arrangement that we have here in the Western US and, 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 and Western Canada, where there are fixed amounts assigned based on priority. Most of all of the, pri of the priority or, uh, prior appropriation water rights in the entire Western US were assigned between 1850 and 1920. There just isn't any water left to claim. Okay? So when we're talking about juniors and seniors, we're really talking about very old juniors and seniors. Now there are some newer <coughs> rights, but they're going to be quite low uh, on the priority, uh, priority basis. So it's important to know that most water is claimed, and most water is claimed a long time ago. And at that time, the, uh, the major use of water was for, for irrigation. Okay? And so we're going to focus on why it emerged in the way that it did, and why it was quite different from uh, the repairing system. Another place that has, uh, is quite similar in many ways, of course, is Australia. But Australia is just very different at the same time. It was much more centralized, far fewer streams, and the state owned the water from the start and manages it pretty much in a, in a, in a cap and trade system. So irrigators in urban areas and others get a share of an annual total allowable, and they can adjust that share, and, and parties uh, share in that okay. appropriately. And so in this study, we're not making first best claims that if you were from Mars and you were to design a water right system and you had full information, this was the system that you would design. That's not what we're claiming. What we're doing is we're looking at a system that emerged at a time when the Western US was and Western Canada were being settled, at a time when there was huge uh, gaps in information about the quality of the landscape uh, in terms of soil quality, topography, growing conditions, and the location uh, and, uh, uh, and of, of the best diversion sites and the nature of stream flows. So you didn't know whether or not that water was going to be running over time, but you would observe at any point in time what the condition of the stream was. We'll come back and look at that uh, in just a moment. What I want you to see here is just how rapidly this prior appropriation water rights system emerged along in the western frontier. So every, and that what we have on here are stream densities. Uh, but essentially, in this region here, basically it's all riparian. The settlement process is moving across the country like this. There's some of it jumping over here, but, but basically it's, it's moving across the country. In this range of states here and also over here, you have a mix of wetter regions where there's higher, more precipitation, greater stream density. And then you have the semi-arid portion that's really in between. And these are the places where you have these dual uh, systems of both riparian and, and, and prior appropriation for surface water. Okay. What we're going to examine is why this happened. And this all happens in about 40 years. A complete shift away from the incumbent riparian system to a different one. And what we're interested in is explaining, well, why did that happen? And then after we tell you and show you through the data why it had important economic consequences, then we can talk towards the end about why it has uh, persisted and how an incumbent rights system 
as a path dependency because it affects, first off, how local economies grow and then develop, develop into other things. It develop, it, it influences how the society grows because you have people who own water and own land and other, and other people who don't. And so that influences local economic conditions. It influences the distribution of political power and what have you. So it has a profound impact on the way in which regions develop even after the initial use changes. Okay? And so that is what, why it is so important to keep in mind that if you have an incumbent rights system, it's a lot easier to work within it than to try to bulldoze it aside because you have a lot of parties who will, will resist that and uh, then it becomes very costly and time consuming uh, to respond. But we'll come back to that. Uh, later, uh, so so this. Let me uh, jump back here so you can see uh, this. The notion that the West was uh, different, of course, uh, was not a surprise. Uh, most people, as they're my immigrants, as they're migrating across uh, the continent, of course, realize that it's pretty dry out here relative to Eastern conditions. And John Wesley Powell has this wonderful. Uh, uh, print uh, in his 1878 report to Congress on the report on the arid lands of, of North America. But it's pretty much the way uh, it is now. This right along the 100th meridian uh, becomes much drier and then over here uh, much wetter. And uh, Powell recognized in the 1870s that uh, a different rights system was, and a different way of allocating land was probably going to be important. We didn't change the way we allocated land, but because that was centralized in Congress, but water was a local thing, and uh, prior appropriation developed pretty much voluntarily, simultaneously across the western U.S. So it had to have profound uh, economic advantages for that to happen, you get that kind of broad pattern. And uh, Colorado is sort of at the epicenter of all this. It's the first state other than California to really be settled intensively uh, in, in the West as parties are migrating across the, the country. And it's a place where prior appropriation developed and was enshrined into law. Uh, there are important court cases and it, it isn't that Wyoming and Utah and other places waited for the local paper to talk about Colorado law, but uh, water law, but at the same time, they were influenced by it and they made adjustments to it. And this became known as the Colorado Doctrine. So that's one reason why we focus on Colorado. The other is that Colorado, for a variety of reasons, has maintained a database on all of its surface water rights. So we have all of the, Cal uh, the Colorado uh, water rights. And so that allows us to develop data and do tests that would be broadly applicable uh, for other places as well. So uh, now with that, let me uh, jump back and, and, and get started. Uh, so uh, essentially, as I said, it moves very quickly as a, a voluntary institutional innovation to meet new uh, economic uh, conditions. What is... Um, we point out in the paper, but I think is also re relevant because uh, California is somewhat different uh, in that Colorado, uh, the prior appropriation rights system provided for, uh, oh, this is generalizable across all states, it provided for secure water to claimants. And so why was that important? Because it provided a basis for collective action, for bargaining around in irrigation infrastructure. And that's this collective action by contract in, in our title. This was important when you had hundreds of thousands of people migrating across a vast terrain with limited information, very little in common, other than they wanted to, to uh, do better in life and develop uh, the economies around local resources. Okay. Prior appropriation becomes a formal mechanism to bring these people together to solve an important collective action problem dealing with who do we bargain with and how do we get sufficient water to invest in, in infrastructure for irrigation. Because importantly, across western streams, oftentimes the most valuable agricultural land, the most productive agricultural land is remote to, from the stream. And so you have to get the water elsewhere. 
and it's enormously expensive. And so who is going to do this? And this is all pre, uh, the, pre the Reclamation Act. So this is done by private individuals in what probably is one of the largest private infrastructure investments in the country, in the country's economic history. And so in Colorado alone by 1920, so this still predates even though the, the Reclamation Act was passed earlier, uh, nevertheless things don't get underway uh, for, for, for some time. Um, by 1920, private investment in irrigation infrastructure in Colorado was about $1 trillion in today's dollars. So we're talking real money here. Um, I just went back through the paper this morning to remind myself some of the data that this, that this made feasible. Uh, over uh, almost 110,000 canals, uh, reservoirs with 21 million gallons, uh, 21 million acre feet of storage. That's about half of what California has today with all of its massive state funded and federal funded, federally funded uh, uh, reservoir uh, system. So this is in Colorado alone, all private, okay? And this is all based around a resource that up until the development of prior appropriation had been a common resource. And it could have been allocated by a riparian system, but it was not. And so let me show you why it was not and then uh, talk a little bit about the framework that we set up uh, the hypotheses that we develop and then the, the data that we assemble uh, in order to test them. Oops, wrong direction here. So this is the Cache La Poudre. It's uh, a stream in northern Colorado uh, near uh, 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 where uh, Fort Collins and, and Colorado State are. But so what we've done here is we put 160 acre squares along the flow of the Cashel Pooter in, in the part of the Cashel Pooter that, could, that was in sufficiently flat area for agriculture. <laughs> now why do that? Well, because we had a 160 acre uh, homestead act that allocated land in small squares effectively. And what I want you to see is that the important bargaining or contracting problem that the repairing system would have presented had it been held to. Because it wasn't a situation where we have people lining up in the thousands waiting to enter into Colorado or California or Montana or wherever to claim water. They come in sequentially, uh, sometimes in clusters, sometimes less so. But the point is they come along and they claim, they claim some water. Okay? Now if they'd done it under a repairing system, then they would have known well, we have to actually get this water out here, remote from the site. And so as a consequence, we have to build an irrigation system. And in order to really make that functional, we have to have a certain amount of water. Okay. So we do all that under the repairing system. And then, lo and behold, any one of these potential homestead plots along here, these are all hypothetical, but the point is, any one of these could be then claimed. And under the repairing system, the claimant would then have claim upon water from the stream. And so the agreement that had been reached earlier up here for an irrigation system now would have had to bargain in some manner with the folks down there to ensure that their claims on water weren't infringing on the repairing claim down here. Okay? And as you start to magnify all the potential entry, you can see why this just doesn't work, okay? It adds way too much uncertainty. Moreover, who do you bargain with if you're going to invest in irrigation system, okay? Are you going to, essentially you have to bargain with everybody on the stream. Okay? And you won't know all those, who those parties are and the full uh, number of them until the thing is fully claimed. And so a repairing system added way too much uncertainty as to water quality and also water security to allow for the kind of infrastructure investment that I, I just mentioned to you. Let me show you, uh, we just overlaid. This is, these are actual irrigation ditches, some of which went over 50 miles uh, that were put into place 
along the cash flow curve, right? And so you can see that if you're investing early up here around Fort Collins or down here around Greeley uh, or, or, or wherever, you have to have some sense of how much water you're going to have among the parties that are going to be participating in the construction and financing of this irrigation system. So you have to have a way of defining who has a water right, how much water they have, and then once you do that, they can, you can start this construction of the ditch. But then you can also structure a, a ditch governance system, and so in Colorado it's primarily uh, municipal uh, ditches or, uh, or other some, some irrigation districts, but primarily the, the ditch systems. Um, and as a consequence, you have a way of enforcing that every party then has to contribute to the investment as they planned, as they promised when the thing started. So prior appropriation solves two important problems. First off, it allows for a, the assignment of a water right based on time. So the first parties that, that claim water up here are the ones that would have the most secure claim on water. It gives them a fixed amount and then allows everyone to know who is there, who has water at that place, and then they can proceed to invest in this irrigation district system. So that, in a nutshell, is why prior appropriation emerged in the way it did. Okay. Now what we will do is uh, we'll develop a little uh, game theoretic model uh, that talks about claimants to water, uh, the requirements for them uh, to claim water, and then to bargain over investment, in this case an irrigation investment, and how they enforce those claims. And I won't go over the, this, uh, this framework, but it does give us a series of tests that uh, separate prior appropriation from a riparian system and then allow us to confront those tests or those hypotheses with the data. Okay? So that becomes very important. And so here are a series of, uh, of, of tests. Uh, one is, unlike a riparian system, prior appropriation encourages advertising and having more people show up on the river, all right? In a riparian system, you don't want that because every additional claimant takes some of the water you'd like to use, so you, you want it to be secret if you could imagine that. But prior appropriation didn't work like that. You actually needed a clustering of people uh, in order to have a sufficient number uh, in order to invest in irrigation infrastructure. And the nice thing, you know, Western history is just great fun to read, at least for me. And um, so if you read, for example, about some of these uh, 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 water uh, groups in, in Colorado, uh, one at the Greeley Colony is a group of folks that came out. They were all sort of uh, bound together in a, uh, in, in, a, in a certain way, so they called themselves a colony. They advertised in the New York Herald Tribune for people to join, okay, because they needed a large number of these folks in order to have enough of them to, um, to uh, invest uh, in irrigation infrastructure uh, in northern Colorado. You just would not have that with a riparian system. Okay? And so anyway, we're going to be able to look at that to see about, uh, about uh, the importance of previous claims on a stream and how that encouraged subsequent claims. Then we're going to look at, well then, who invested in this uh, 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 irrigation structure? And we'll, we'll drive some predictions there, and what we're gonna find is the most secure, the highest priority, the senior rights holders are the ones that are the primary investors, the ones that invest the most uh, in, in inf irrigation infrastructure. And when we say the most irrigation infrastructure, the way we'll measure that is in ditch length, okay? Now, they, then we'll also go further than that. We'll look at actually how this adds to agricultural land. Non-riparian land turns out to be more valuable, more productive than the rugged lands typically along many western streams. And so it adds, it almost doubles the value of agricultural output per acre and increases the value of agricultural production. And this is all among 
thousands of people who otherwise wouldn't be doing anything together, okay? They're coming out, they're staking their claims, they're trying to be farmers or whatever, and, but this system brings them together. Now, the nice thing about our data set is that we also have a part of Colorado, we didn't need that, okay? Where the people were uh, there earlier and were bound, the, the Hispanic settlers from northern New Mexico that came up and settled in the San Luis Valley actually didn't need a formal property right to coordinate their investment and their activities. And so what we can do is to separate out these sections of Colorado to see whether the investment effects, the clustering effects, are the same across these different populations. And what we're going to find is the prior appropriation, while recognized in the data uh, in, in this uh, San Luis Valley region, uh, has no impact on investment okay, and the management of, of water use because you didn't need it. But elsewhere uh, in Division I, Colorado is divided up into seven different management divisions, but the two big ones that we look at are one and three. Uh, they're in Division I, where parties are coming from all over the, the country and that indeed all over the world, uh, they did need a, 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 a way to get together and to move forward in their prior appropriation uh, plays a critical role. So it's a nice opportunity to test the role of a formal property right in bringing economic, productive economic activity together. And then when you don't need it, okay, when a community is sufficiently cohesive along a variety of, of, of margins that you don't need a formal arrangement. And this, blends more to the kind of work that Eleanor Ostrom and others who, who some of you may be familiar with uh, 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 have laid out, okay? So uh, basically, the, these are, we're gonna look at why the prior appropriation develop, what were its unique uh, benefits, and uh, as I said, what we're going to look at, if we can, we have predictions about location choice, who's going to cooperate, how much they're going to invest, and how much income this generates. The final thing we do is we say, okay, how important was this, this uh, irrigated agricultural production in, in Western GDPs? Turned out to be surprisingly hard because there just aren't estimates of state GDP uh, 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 out there that are easy to assemble. But fortunately, Richard Easterlin, who's at USC now, uh, had assembled data on state and territorial GDPs up to um, about 1900 or something. And what we did is then taking new census data, we could build on that and, and calculate the impact. And what we get is something in the neighborhood of between three and 20%. And this, we're not even applying any multipliers. The multipliers are usually double that. Uh, to state GDP from agricultural development, all based on prior appropriation, all by 1930, okay? Uh, so this just talks a little bit about the structure, and I want to skip over that. Uh, these are the hypotheses I just talked about. I want to describe the data to you. Uh, because this is, as I mentioned to you, there haven't been that many uh, study, uh, quantitative studies of water. Uh, in California uh, or, or anywhere, and so this, uh, this was a, a challenge for us. So what we have are, uh, I'll show you in a moment the different ways in which we assemble the data, but we have in, in the data set of just about 8,000 claims maintained by the Department of Water Resources in, in, in Colorado. And it gives you uh, information on the location, the precise location, the amount of water, and the date also, in some cases, gives you the ditch name. Okay. From that, we assemble information on the stream, and there, surprisingly, are no long-term consistent uh, stream flow variables, so we had to construct those because we were interested in including drought. Okay? One of our hypotheses is when a party would claim, a sp so we wanted to see if this was systematic in any way. Okay, if we could predict where people would make claims. And we can, we can do that. And we, we, one of the arguments is at this time you're gonna make a claim to water on observables, on what you knew at a time when you didn't know very much. 
And so you're not going to know that there is a lot of variation in precipitation if you're just a migrant, recent migrant to the western frontier. You are going to know if there's drought. You, are going to, you will know topography, you will, but you will not really know soil quality and so forth. So in a moment, I'll show you some of our tests. And it turns out unobservables are really not statistically important in determining a claim. But observables are. And the two key ones are whether or not there was a prior claim, in fact, it's the most important one, or whether or not there was a drought. Okay? And others have the predictive signs, uh, but are not important. So uh, then we assemble uh, data uh, from PRISM uh, at Oregon State. And uh, then uh, we develop mean and, and variance and flow measures for all the streams in Colorado in our data set. We don't look at, uh, I've forgotten the division, but the west of the continental divide, the most uh, mountainous parts of uh, of Colorado and kind of northwestern Colorado because they're not important for anything other than mining. And mining was important, and they develop a prior appropriation <coughs> system there. But we're really interested in, in agricultural use because that's the long-term uh, most important economic activity. Uh, we develop uh, train uh, measures uh, using uh, the GIS software, uh, soil productivity measures, and then we have uh, data uh, settlement by land office and, um, and that we've assembled. So we wanted to see whether there were other factors that might affect uh, where you would, uh, where you would uh, uh, claim. Let me see if I can bring up these summary statistics so you could see. Well, maybe not so easily. Let me see if I... Well, I, I'll show you these summary statistics in just a moment. Uh, well, maybe I can do that right now. If I, I hate it when people do this, but I'm going to do it. Uh, so we, we assemble the data in two ways. One is uh, stream level and then claim level. And so we're interested in where people, on what streams and, and what would affect the stream characteristics in terms of claiming a, a particular site, because we know when they are claimed and so forth. And we do this over the, a time period from 1850 to 2013, I think. And we know there are about 3,000 streams in, in, in our data set in Colorado. So this generates an enormous number of observations. Of course, in most years, on most streams, there aren't any claims. Okay. But it does, it allows us to have enough observations and sufficient variation that we can then do a, a variety of tests. In some cases, we don't have like the flow variability. We can only construct those for a, a smaller set of, of streams and so forth. But basically, we have information on, on loamy soil, so productive, percent homestead effects in a variety of ways, drought, stream flow variability, topography, uh, these some more stream flows. Uh, and, and, and individual claims. Go back to where I was at here. So the first thing we do is to look at the determinants of a claim, all right? And essentially what we find is looking across this data set, across this whole time period, the most important single determinant of whether an individual would claim on a stream at any point in time, in any particular place, is whether somebody else had claimed near there. Now this seems like, well, um, seems so obvious, and yet the established, the most important paper in economics on water, uh, Burness and Quirk from 1978, so I told you how old in the AER, has a prediction that actually people wouldn't do that. They weren't really, they never confronted any data with this. But the argument was, well, if somebody else claims already on a stream, then there would be less water for somebody else. And so they would tend to migrate away. And that's one of the, the predictions that comes out of their model. But our framework suggests that actually it would be just the opposite of that, up to some point. Okay? That if somebody else claimed on a particular stream, that would be a good place for you to claim, because then you could jointly uh, invest with them in irrigation. They also may have revealed to you where the best diversion sites might be. Okay. So there are a variety of reasons why 
you would want to uh, stake a claim near somebody else. And then later, and I'll show you, we'll be able to look at how these parties cooperated. And the way we define cooperation is in the, from the data set, we have all of the claims that were made at a specific site on the same day. Okay? So they could only be for a particular ditch. And as I said, often is the case they name the ditch. But in our separate data that we have, we have that information. Okay? And then we'll know ditch length, and we can see, well, how far did they go, and, and, and so forth. So there are a variety of things that we can do. Um, so the, the probability of a new claim increases the claim by about, a subsequent claim by about 20%. Okay, this is by far the strongest explanatory variable. Um, droughts, also uh, in terms of positive claims, droughts reduce claiming on a stream by about 40%. So if, you, if there is a, a, a drought, then uh, a current drought, then it reduces the likelihood of a claim that year. Yeah. Uh, the other factors, as I said before, that tend less to be less observable, certainly soil, Topography, people were getting a set, a set of, but they still wouldn't have. And stream flow variation uh, just do not play an important role. And, and I can show you uh, the full uh, regression results uh, if we have time uh, shortly. Um, we, because there are a variety of identification issues, we uh, try to, to deal with that. Uh, so let's see. Um, I want to show you. So this is the... Not the one I wanted to show you. Um, let me scroll forward here. So here is the, the, the marginal effects of having a prior claim. Okay? And so what we have here is summer flows. So that's the best indicator of stream size. And this is the, the marginal effect of a new claim given a previous claim. And what we see is that it grows with stream size. And that's sensible because on the one hand, the resource constraint is reduced, but also it's the larger streams that offer the greatest opportunity for irrigation investment and moving sufficient quantities of water off stream for irrigation elsewhere. I want to show you what the data look like. Uh, and I, okay. So here what the data look like. What we did is to look at all the possible places that you could establish a claim. We're back to our, our 160 acre squares. And this are a hypothetical homestead claim on a stream. And so these are along all the streams. We remove places where there wouldn't be, there are no streams, so they couldn't be, uh, they couldn't be potentially claimed. But these are all the potential claims in essentially eastern Colorado using this, this kind of GIS approach. And these are the actual claims that are put into place. But it's these data, uh, these locations, that we then test where the location of the claim would be at any point in time, subject to the characteristics of the stream that I just described to you. So that uh, is our, how do we explain where people made claims? Then the second one is, well, what did they do once they had these claims? Um, so jumping back. Um, so the, these are the, these are the, the claim data, okay? And what we do in, in this second uh, part of the, of the empirical analysis is, as I said, what do they do when they have the claim? So we, Examine, we have claim size, claim date, total income generated, irrigated acres, and so forth. Now, a lot of these data are actual, and then the priority bins. And th the nice thing for us, there were two special uh, censuses of one, northeastern Colorado, which was largely heterogeneous and so forth in terms of claiming division one. And then the more homogeneous in terms of the social characteristics of the population, Division Three, uh, where they actually included farms, farm size, value production, 
and so forth. So then we can, it allows us to then actually test to see what the impacts of the system were uh, across these different, uh, these two different populations. The first thing we do though, before we do that, is to look at coordination. And the argument, or investment, the argument that we make is that the highest priority is the most secure water, and that's where the investment will take place. And that's indeed what we find. Uh, so users with higher priority are more likely to cooperate and invest in greater diversion infrastructure. Uh, and so we won't, I won't get into some of the econometric issues. Uh, this is the, uh, uh, the empirical estimations, uh, it's, it's just that. Um, let me just show you what the results are. Your income. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't work. Um, these are, this is, this is division three. So these, uh, this is essentially irrigated land that's brought into place, division three, away from streams. That's, we have a similar one for division one. Um, and let's, where is that in my, well, let me just scroll back here. I want to show you how the priority band changes, um, or how the, uh, oh, here we go. This is the marginal effect of priority on, in, on cooperation or investment. And what this shows you is that it's relative to the mean uh, priority bid. So essentially, these are the highest priority and these are the lowest priority, the most junior claimants. Right? These are the most senior claimants relative to the mean claimant. All right? And what we see is cooperation in terms of making a claim at a specific place at a specific time is much more likely to occur for the highest, the most senior priority uh, water claimants. And that is sensible because that's the most secure water if we're going to jointly invest in irrigation infrastructure, then that's where we, we want to do it with that group. It's far less important for juniors. So among juniors, they're much more likely to be singly located out somewhere else on the stream with no important irrigation investment. Um, what we find is that the highest priority parties are by far the most likely to uh, cooperate in investment. They have more ditches and the ditches are about 10 miles longer than the mean priority, okay? It's 10 miles longer ditch on average for the highest priority parties relative to the mean priority party, and then the lower priorities even, even less. Uh, if we compare, uh, but that is only the case in division one. In division three that I mentioned to you is largely Hispanic, there's no impact on cooperation of the priority system. If we then look at the increase, and I'll show you in a moment, the increase in, uh, in income generated, there are comp the soil is comparable in terms of productivity across both, uh, both regions, Division I and Division Three. But cooperation under prior appropriation outside of the riparian area in Division I actually incre dramatically increases productivity. And why does it do that? Well, first off, you get to more productive soil, but moreover, it allows for larger farms. Because then farms, you move out and can take advantage of a variety of new technologies that are being implemented at this time in terms of planting and harvesting that required larger than 160 acre farms. All this takes place because of the prior appropriation system. And so it almost doubles the value of ag agricultural production per acre. And this does not happen in Division Three, okay? And so, but it's not, resource cons it's not a resource issue. The productivity of the soil, repairing the soil is about the same. Uh, 
Um, so this is, as I was describing to you, the differences in these two, these two people, uh, two groups, and whether or not uh, coordination uh, is important. Uh, this is uh, in, in division, division uh, one. And this is irrigated land and uh, a log that is added because of the ability to move water off site away from the stream in, in division one. Um, these are our estimates of the increase in productivity or in value um, on income per acre. And so depending on the, con the kind of estimate that we use, we get between 100 and $130 per acre increase in production, in income per acre. Okay. We don't get anything statistically important in, in Division Three. If you read the uh, historical literature on um, in the sociological literature uh, about Hispanic settlement in southern Colorado and northern New Mexico, there is a reason you can explain this ex post in the sense that they had tight knit communities who didn't need a formal rights system to, to help people coordinate or to manage their water and their production and their stream maintenance. It was all done within the community. In, the, in, in Division I, where there is no community effectively, a right system provided for that. And here we look at the, the broader effects, the increase in irrigated, ag, uh, irrigated acres that results from moving water in Division One. You do get water moved from the riparian area in Division Three, but it's not nearly so significant, and the increases in overall the value of production in two areas. But again, average income per acre across the board is quite similar. So we're really moving into new areas and adding to new productivity in Division I in a manner through the prior appropriation system that does not take place so much in Division III. Um, these are the estimates that um, we assembled on the impact through between, using 1910 and 1930 census data um, as to we're, we wanted to stop at 1930 because then you start to move more into groundwater, pivot irrigation and so forth, and then it's going to contaminate the effects of being able to move surface water, which was our primary focus in this paper. But you get an idea of the range uh, of differences in state uh, income associated with irrigated agriculture by 1930. The standard in economic development uh, multipliers range from two to four. So you can multiply by that two, three to four, and you'd be consistent with estimates about the importance of agricultural development and overall, uh, the overall economy. Um, so what I want to do uh, to, to wrap this up and then open it up is first I want to remind you that the prior appropriation system emerged to meet a specific problem that was associated throughout the semi-arid West in the US and Canada. The primary thing people are interested in is agriculture. Most of the agriculture had to take place off stream and it involved in very important investment. So you have to find a way how you're gonna bring that money together and have then subsequent coordinated agricultural development and maintain those ditches once you do that. And the prior appropriation system did that. We're also able to compare uh, between the, the performance of these two areas, the one area that did not really need a prior appropriation or a formal property right in an area that, that did, and that's Division I and, and Division Three. See, What I wanted to add is, as I mentioned in the beginning, we're not saying that a prior appropriation system was the best of all worlds in hindsight, if today, if we're looking back. But it was the best of all worlds given the setting that people faced at the time. And it's the system that we now have. And it's all over the West. Okay? In California, Oregon, Washington, and parts of Nebraska, uh, Iowa, uh, I mean, uh, Oklahoma, Texas, you do have a riparian system as well, but it's primarily prior appropriation. So back to the opening remark that I had, is if the state, uh, for example, in California, mandates that 30% of, of stream, of, of 
low water mark in stream flow should has to stay within the stream. Some kind of man, uh, mandate like that. That's going to be a direct tax on seniors, right? Because in very dry years, seniors will be the only ones that get water, right? But if they're already not able to uh, access a, a fixed amount of water that is mandated to stay in stream, and I can understand why people would want that, but nevertheless, it's a tax on people that already own that water. And they're not going to like it. And they're going to challenge it in court. And it's going to be a fight. All the time, the ecological and environmental benefits that we want won't happen. And in the case of, of, of Mono uh, and, the, and Owens Valley, Los Angeles fought over its water for 20 years. And all that time, the level of Mono Lake was drawn down. So a policy implication from this is that if you want the water, you buy it. You buy it in a way that no one is made worse off, no one is bearing a disproportionate cost <coughs> to achieve a particular new, a new benefit that we would like. Okay? If an urban area wants agricultural water, they have to buy it. And we, we have a fairly uh, vigorous water market in California, but in other states as well. Uh, and there are other uh, NGOs like uh, the Nature Conservancy and Freshwater Trust and so forth that are buying or leasing water rights for in-stream flows. Those are not controversial. You achieve the environmental objective up front, and people aren't feeling aggrieved and challenging it in court. But see, I think by understanding why prior appropriation emerged in the way it did and its economic contribution, we don't really get into its path dependencies over time, but they're there. Um, then I think it helps to explain why, if you don't recognize the prior appropriation system, it's going to be a challenge to implement in the other uh, policy that you might want to overlay it. Okay. The final uh, one in that regard is the public trust doctrine, which assigns a state the right to periodically reallocate water if new uses of water are viewed in the public trust. And it seems to me that's perfectly fine. Buy the water. Uh, if you somehow think that the water isn't currently being allocated in the way that you'd like. The pushback from that is, gee, it'd be way too expensive. Well, if it's that valuable, appropriate the funds. Otherwise, you're forcing certain parties to pay for this, uh, and they're not going to like it. They're not going to get commensurate benefit. So that's, I think, a, a policy implication uh, that, you, uh, that you could draw uh, from the study, and with that, I'm, I'm all open for, for discussion. Excellent. <clears throat>